Pooms and I are going to handle this. Poomkar is going to kind of jump in here and there and help us out, and we'll get rocking. Slide. You got control, Poomkar, not me. There we go. <laughs> uh, if you're not familiar with MakerDAO, decentralized governance, the granddaddy of DeFi, they kind of kicked it all off. They have a full decentralized governance model, and they manage the generation of DAI, the soft peg stablecoin, and they have their own embedded governance mechanism within the entire Maker protocol. Slide. They said, MakerDAO pretty much kicked off DeFi. These are the guys who got the whole thing rolling and really brought it out. Uh, they started with eDollar, which was a different kind of weird thing, but they kind of worked its way in slowly. It took four years to get MakerDAO off the ground. And with DAI and all of their vaults, it's got the entire thing put together for the Maker market, which is why it's called MakerDAO. Uh, slide. All right, so basically what is a maker vault and what is it all about? Well, it's frictionless borrowing. It's truly permissionless and bankless. You get to walk on there, deposit your own assets into the, into the vaults, take out DAI, which is their soft peg stablecoin, no credit scores, no gatekeepers, all done on chain, and the collateral is backed by your assets. It's 150% requirement. Uh, MakerDAO recommends in their documents that you keep your collateral closer to 300% so you don't get wrecked or liquidated as we're seeing right now across a lot of different DeFi protocols. Everybody's getting liquidated. So just a quick example, if you wanted to have $9,000 $9, with ETH to borrow $3,000 worth of DAI, it could be very safe or degen it out and get a $4,500 worth of DAI and pray your <laughs> collateral only goes up. If the value of your collateral does drop, the vault will liquidate you. Now slide. There we go. So make it that community. Uh, People who come together and actually hold the MKR token are the ones who are uh, handling the governance and the community of the, of the entire DAO. The DAO teams, individuals, those who are put together to actually take on the DAO and handle everything. And then there's external actors, which is kind of really important to understand as we go forward. Uh, the keepers, these guys are usually bots. Uh, they're elected or brought in to handle, handle all the liquidations that happen, which is done through auctions. So these keepers sit around and they keep an eye on vaults. And as the collateral levels start to get low, uh, they begin to bring in the auction mechanism to auction off the collateral to make sure that the entire MakerDAO system stays solvent. Uh, price oracles. This is a really big one. When you're dealing with decentralized DeFi protocol, especially when it comes to liquidation, where you're getting your price inputs matters. So just say, for example, they, they only used one single oracle. If the price were to drop from ETH, so it should be $1,100 right now, if it was reading at 980 it might liquidate a ton of vaults that shouldn't. So Maker does a full election to make sure they have the right oracles and multiple oracle streams coming in at one time to ensure that nothing in the vaults is ever liquidated incorrectly. The feed is really important how the information comes in. When you're dealing with smart contracts, the information going into that contract is critical here. Uh, and then there's the global settlers, which are the emergency oracles. These guys are here to help as a last line of defense in case there's an attack on the governance or on the price systems. They can freeze everything in the system. They can change how prices are inputted and they can mitigate large losses if people start to do a bank run or if anything goes absolutely crazy inside of MakerDAO and can pause or emergency shut down the system. Uh, slide. Oh, wait, actually, Joe, if you wanted to talk about the recent liquidation and how it impacts the keepers, that would be really great. Uh, yeah, sure. So the keepers get to go ahead and do the liquidation auctions. So if we'll say that, uh, obviously the big one everybody's worried about right now, we'll say Celsius. Celsius is carrying a massive rat Bitcoin um, vault right now, MakerDAO, with a huge die alone. Uh, I think 13,000 Bitcoins are locked up in there. It's a really large one. So if that were to get liquidated, the keepers would go ahead and start an auction selling off all that rat Bitcoin, trying to get the all the die back into the system so they don't have any kind of loss at the whole point. The scary part is if you have massive liquidations like that, the whole market price can dank. And the theoretical scary part is that the price would go so low that the sales that would happen wouldn't cover the die inside. But on the plus side, if you are being liquidated and these keepers can do the auction and they can get all the die back that maker is owed and they can also get back extra, you are paid back the extra. So if you're liquidated, you actually get to get some of your collateral back if the auction's in your favor. So these bots can actually make some money off of it. So they're usually bots, sometimes they're individual actors, but when these auctions go through, uh, if you have, if there's extra money in there, there's some arbitrage opportunities, the keepers are to keep the discount. So. It's kind of an interesting model for people to watch these and they can look at what's going on and uh, hopefully make a couple bucks off liquidating people. So that's kind of the whole keeper idea. 
that cover your question for you, for your idea? For sure. And then there's also other external actors, including you and Punkar. Um, did you want to discuss shortly your meta governance and how that applies? Yeah, so uh, Punkar and I recently just talked to MakerDAO. We're now uh, part of as a governance house. We are now all uh, delegates. So people who hold large stakes of Maker can delegate their voting power to us uh, to go through and make votes for different protocols. And we'll go through and make sure that we are doing what's in best case for that protocol and be writing opinions. And Punkar, you want to jump in here and explain some more about governance house? That'd be awesome. Yeah, sounds good. Uh, yeah, so... Uh... It's basically one uh, of the type of delegation uh, within the within their governance. Uh, you know, some some DAOs uh, decide to delegate all the votes, so there is almost like you need to be a you know recognized delegate or steward or however it's called to be able to vote. But uh, in case of Maker, uh, you don't need to, but like there are like, pre let's say preferred option, like all professional delegates, which are getting even paid for, you know, being there and like deciding on behalf of maker uh, MKR holders uh, and, you know, and justifying also their decision. So the logic behind is that there, are, there is so much happening that not every individual token holder can like know about everything and really go deep into the topics and decide on behalf of basically their own token like what is the best for maker so they have created this kind of recognized delegate platform where like we as a governance house which is independent uh governance entity can be there on behalf of those token holders we can go deeper into uh, maker, we can, you know, study uh, the product, the strategy, have discussions with all the core units, know where maker is heading, and trying to help navigate them through. So that's what Joe, I, and few others will be doing now. Uh, we just got set up over the weekend, so there is a video. If anyone wants, like. Uh, where we are explaining who we are and uh, what is the you know main goal of ours it's really to push maker forward like to be able uh, you know to reach their goals with real world assets and other initiatives and we believe that we have you know that knowledge that we will get also that support from uh, MKR token holders to help execute uh, some of those uh, votes and some of those projects. And on top of it, uh, and that's where kind of bankless consulting comes in place is, uh, we might see some, some things where bankless consulting can really help maker, where maybe, you know, this is like governance topic. So let's say about their governance, we might see that there are some gaps and maybe we can help to fill th those gaps or like, restructure the governance in the way that it will be more efficient. And that's also another kind of goal of ours to identify where they can be more efficient, where, you know, Bankless Consulting and others can help Maker uh, to become a better DeFi protocol. Let me pause here if there are any questions regarding that. Thank you for the explanation, Hansar. Of course. Joe, do you want to add something to it? No, you covered it well, man. We're just here to help and here to uh, getting people involved in voting more. <laughs> yeah, so far we have zero MKR delegated to us, but that's because the contract got set up like a few hours ago. Did you want to talk about the MKR governance token, Joe? Sure. Uh, so MKR is the governance token of MakerDAO. Uh, you get to vote on all of the different, you make proposals like any other governance token. So make proposals, vote on snapshots, and go ahead and put uh, posts to the forum. 
to go through and vote on how the protocol handles it, uh, what kind of parameters they're using. So from Oracle feeds for prices, uh, triggering shutdowns, making uh, maker improvements pro uh, performance protocols, uh, or to go out and add new risk types or new, sorry, asset types or risk parameters. Uh, it's really important that the community looks at what kind of collateral to allow in the vaults. If you started letting people lock up all kinds of crazy tokens, you're going to have wild price fluctuations, mass liquidations that would actually destabilize the protocol. So vetting and ensuring that only really high quality assets end up in these vaults is really important. And right now it's only ERC-20 tokens are not allowing anything else in the vaults at this time based on how the smart contracts are designed. Uh, MKR holders also get a little bit of dividend from holding their token. So essentially profits from the protocol uh, in forms of fees when loans are taken out as well as repaid or liquidated go to the MKR holders themselves uh, by buying back tokens. So the price eventually does go up based on how long the protocol has been active for and what kind of fees it generates. So uh, it works a couple different ways to make sure that people who are holding it are getting paid a little bit and incentivizing folks to be active in governance and ensuring the risks and the parameters of the protocol are always safe and active. Slide. And Fiends, I'll pass it off to you. You can take us down Governance Highway and show us what's going on. Yeah, that's that's me. Um, please tell me if it's too loud where I'm at. Um, so MakerDAO governance is, as Joe said, governed by the Maker token, gives you the eligibility to vote. Um, it's divided into two main parts, on-chain and off-chain, um, as well as their governance framework can be broken down into two major components, which I'll describe further on. So there's governance proposals, which are more of a symbolic vote used to pull community sentiment and ex executive votes, which are used to ratify the risk parameters and the results in state changes inside the DAI credit system and occur in every quarter. Um, next slide, please. Um, so off-chain governance is how you would imagine it. It really just supports, what I find interesting about MakerDAO is that it uses off-chain governance as a supporter of on-chain governance by providing a process for gathering feedback for proposing on-chain votes and making decisions that don't require on-chain voting. So things that we would regularly, you know, anticipate things like participating in the forums and the public governance calls. Um, and within the forums, there's these things called forum signal threads. And within that, it's there to particularly measure consensus around the issue and moving the issue to on-chain governance polls. So what this could also be seen as a start after the ideation phase within the governance process. Um, and so once um, forum signals have received enough and reasonable community uh, discussion, the creator of the signal thread will then decide whether to refine the signal thread and post a new one or request that the governance facilitator push it to an on-chain governance poll. Um, what I found really interesting about that is that it goes before it actually moves to votes, it goes through somebody else who then validates whether or not there has been enough discussion or quorum to move it on to an official proposal. And so if the governance facilitator agrees that the issue outlined in the signal thread is ready to go on chain, then the governance facilitator will create an on chain governance pool in the form of the spec specified by the community consensus created in the signal thread. Any questions in regards to off chain governance voting at Maker? Yeah, just, just, just one question. Do, do you have any idea how many decisions they put through with this kind of fairly complicated mechanism? I mean, the mechanism seems to be very robust, but I don't know how fast they could be like by making decisions. Yeah, well, some of the forum signals actually last for a couple of weeks. There's no really great set time. From what I, I mean, I don't know if Levi is still here or... Um, if anybody can answer, add to this, is that from what I've seen, there is no specific limitation on the length of time um, for this. What it is really dependent on is whether or not there has been a reasonable number of discussions for, from community members in order for this to move forward. So um, from what I've read, it's really the governance facilitator who is you know, selected by the community to really decide whether or not it could push forward to an on-chain governance poll. Okay. Thanks. So it's like more serious than our Discord forum. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How we have a forum. <laughs> like if there was like I feel like an example of this would be like in the, in our in our forum to meet a 
to meet a quorum for it to move to grants committee. Can I get a link to the slides? Um, yes, the slides will be shared um, within our governance base camp uh, area. Any other questions on off-chain governance at Maker? Nope. Okay, next slide, please. Maybe, maybe one, one thing what I want to mention just overall uh, regarding, you know, those proposals. Maker is actually, and what that's what I have already been able to capture from people working at Maker. Uh, Ma Maker is actually struggling with too many proposals. Uh, the thing is they are really big and really well known in the ecosystem. And like everyone would like to help, everyone would like to kind of propose, uh, you know, cooperation with their own platform. And this is this is hard to tackle because everything what is happening on MakerDAO needs to go through like really rigorous like security review. It needs to be aligned with, you know, their. Uh, kind of technology stack, but also the strategy. And first and foremost, it needs to be secure. So basically the dev team there like needs to go through every single proposal and needs to kind of put opinion on that and some research and it takes so much time. So that's something what, you know, those more, <laughs> it's like, you know, famous people are struggling with uh, paparazzi and like other, uh, you know, too much publicity and they need to deal with it. Maker has the same thing. Like they are too much publicity. They need to go through too many, too many things. Uh, and, you know, this is something they are trying to deal with through like different levels of governance, but still it's, uh, it's hard uh, to, to like, you know, consume all these things and do their job as well. Fims, please continue. I just wanted to give a little bit of context. Uh, no, I love the context. Thank you so much. Um, but I was also really curious because we had this conversation this morning as well is that whether or not you have found from reading the proposals, Oh, from reading the from reading the proposals, sorry about that. I'm leaving somewhere. Um, from reading the proposals, whether or not there has been duplications of proposals already submitted. Have you seen that, Pankar? Uh, there are definitely duplications, but they do have pretty good uh, management on the forum. Means like there are like people who are managing the forum so they can see it, so they can identify those. Uh, so they've been pretty good in managing those, uh, but there can be very similar proposals, but for very different platforms and then it's different proposals. So it depends. So there will be duplications in the way, like there might be similar proposals, like, you know, we want to onboard DAI or, uh, you know, put DAI on, on Ave or something like that, and there will be put die on another DeFi protocol. So it will be similar or look like, however, it will be different because we are exploring different DeFi protocol, which is interacting with it. Thank you. Um, and so now we can move on to the on-chain governance. And what the first one will be governance polls. And so governance polls are used to measure the sentiment of MKR voters um, and the common period of these polls are between three and to seven days, um, which is actually very important because we know that we are a global community, even within makers, a global community. So providing people enough time frame to vote um, and also to discuss is really, really important. Um, and so these are these polls are used to determine governance and DAO process outside the technical layer of the maker protocol form consensus on important community goals and targets, measure sentiment on potential executive vote proposals, ratify governance proposals originating from the MakerDAO forum signal thread, which we mentioned, determine which values certain system parameters should be set to before those values are then confirmed in an executive vote, and ratify risk parameters for a new collateral type as presented by risk teams. What I actually found interesting though too is that these governance polls have a consistent schedule um, and so they are scheduled to go live on a weekly basis 
every Monday at 12 p.m. Eastern time. So what I, I found that really interesting because then people could always check to see like what new polls are up, um, which could probably increase engagement. I'm not sure if it leads to increased engagement in this case, but, but I thought that was a really interesting um, directive. Next slide. Any questions on governance polls? I mean, we have them here at Bankless as well. Um, but if anybody wanted any clarity on anything. No, just a reiteration of the last slide on the end of it there, just being like how, how critical it is for a protocol like Maker to have risk parameters in place. And when people put these two, these collateral types to a vote to make sure that a risk, te risk team actually goes through and ensures the token has solvency, the diluted supply isn't crazy, the smart contract doesn't have any, you know, malicious code in it. It's hard to have a protocol like Maker quickly do an audit of a token that wants to be part of the vault. So the risk team is really essential over at Maker to make sure this is all safe and uh, secure from a token and chain perspective. Agreed. Um, so their governance proposal process, I also found really interesting um, and intentional. I would be curious to see how effective it really is in terms of engagement. Um, but before a proposal really becomes active, it goes through what I've just described before is like proposal polling. Um, and so that's really just to, again, establish a rough consensus of community sentiment before any executive votes are cast. So this really helps to ensure the governance decisions are considered thoughtfully and reach consensus prior to the voting process itself. And then it goes into active proposals, which are which will allow maker token holders to cast approval votes for the proposals that they want to elect as active proposals. And then the Ethereum address that has the highest number of approval votes is elected as the active proposal. Next slide. And then there are the executive votes. So the executive votes are to execute technical changes to the maker protocol. And when active, each executive vote oh, sorry, um, proposed sets of changes being made by the maker protocol smart contracts. Unlike any other types of votes, executive votes are used as a continuous approval voting in the continuous approval voting model, which I will describe in the next slide. And they're primarily used to either add or remove as well, as well as add or remove collateral types, add or remove vault types, adjust global system parameters, adjust vault specific parameters, and replace modular smart contracts. Um, and so Joe is our DeFi expert in this. <laughs> um, do you want to describe the importance of why executive voting within these types of collateral votes or vault types are really important, especially in terms of risk mitigation? Yeah, as I said, said on the last slide too, it's the same idea to making sure that everything they're adding to these these vaults is correct. Like being able to have somebody who can go over all this and have the knowledge to pull all the contract data and ensure there's no malicious code in any of these things and to ensure that all the risk parameters are adjusted properly. When you're dealing with multiple collateral types at one time and different oracles, things can get crazy. So <laughs> ensuring that you have a, a well, well researched and a proper risk, uh, uh, risk parameters in place is essential for these. So the executive voting process helps a lot with that. I, I got a good question. And um, so these executive votes are not like roads who are considered to be executives. They are like type of special votes, which then are um, conducted or like voted by all the MKR uh, token holders. Is that correct? Yes. So from my understanding, it is more out of the more executive layer of it. So as we saw, what I found really interesting is that throughout the governance process, there are these checks and balances to ensure in which stage the proposal will go ahead. And so this is like very the very last stage of this and how it's implemented could change depending on what is within the smart contract. But yeah, this would be the most like formal type of voting. Okay. I mean, like because like the the um, the decisions are uh, yeah, which are being made. I mean, they they will have some impact, <laughs> which we can see on the slide. So, understand. Sure. And then that's why they also implemented a continuous approval voting model um, as like another checks and balances. Um, so, I can't see. 
see this. Oh, there you go. I can make it down. Um, so in the continuous approval voting, users receive IOU tokens in exchange for their MKR, which is actually locked when they vote. This acts as a secondary governance mechanism, allowing users to continue to vote on governance polls and executive votes without unlocking their MKR. So the continuous approval voting has three main aspects. First is a vote creates a barrier for new proposal, since new proposals need to surpass the voting weight of the last successful proposal. Votes are meant to remain in the system continuously in order to prevent bad proposals from passing easily. And the more votes that there are on the current system, uh, the more secure the system generally is from any rogue proposals. So continuous approval voting systems are actually necessary because at the time a competing proposal to the system could be introduced. And so this system needs to be continuously monitored and governed and thus requires a voting um, construct that reflects on it. And so that's what I also found interesting too, is that it, 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 it's like a live process. Um, any questions or any thoughts on this continuous approval model? Do you think it could apply here at Bankless? Hmm. Yeah, I think the main difference between us and like Bankless and uh, <laughs> said us and I didn't even know what <laughs> I mean. Uh, <laughs> so between Maker and Bankless, uh, it's that, you know, we do have mostly like non smart contract types of decisions means like we have that committee or that person who actually will be executing those votes so i think in that at that case like we do have like rather the you know manual kind of checks uh to it means like we don't need to have system in place who will be kind of checking for it for competing proposals and so on because we kind of have the community behind uh, and there is always like a way how to, even if the proposal is up, how to either take it down or vote against or like make sure that like all the aspects are considered. But in terms of on-chain proposals, you know, which are automatically executed, then that's different. Uh, because when it did go, gets voted in, it gets executed and that it can cause significant issues if it's not, you know, the correct proposal or it's not ex uh, executed correctly. Unka, could you imagine, imagine this kind of voting concept for like, I would say associate um, important votes, which would have a major influence or impact on bankless consulting itself? So like it's it seems to me that you have flatter like flesh in the game here and um, I mean it has it has some value in it so from from what from which I can tell just like an imagination I'm not sure Marcus if I'm following the question okay so I I try it again so let's let's imagine like so we at backlist consulting would have to make some important decisions as well mm -hmm. so i could imagine that this kind of um voting mechanism like continuous approval could be beneficial because you would have some skin in the game for example as the with the associate role or representative role or something and my question would be, do you see the same or making I uh, do I make something uh, impossible up here in my mind? Yeah, I see your point. I think I think that that point you mentioned, like have a skin in a game, it's important means like that you you can lose if you are like, you know, having some like, let's say like you are trying to over like really do something like bad uh to bankless consulting and like then you like you know put few people together and you vote on something and then you know it you it will get discovered you should be losing your status just by the fact that you went against the community probably like in terms yeah. of that like i think it makes sense i'm not sure if this one 
will be the best like like technically the best approach but definitely like the the mindset like that there is always like if you are voting you are putting your name you are putting your stake like into it like I, I i think that's generally makes sense so you are really deciding what makes sense for the community and long term uh for the long term success yeah Thanks. yep i, I mean, think it's a good point i mean outside of the continuous approval i think that the governance facilitator process is Chris, is really interesting and can apply to to bankless consulting right it's like really to ensure that everybody has developed consensus in something in order for it to actually be an active proposal. So I think that we could apply a lot of learnings within it, like not even in Bankless Consulting and VDAO in general. Um, and and I, I just really appreciate the checks and balances behind it, but I'm also curious on the efficiency of, uh, or efficacy in, in regards to the engagement, um, which I would probably analyze later on. Um, next slide, please, Punkar. So risk mitigations. Um, and so there are a few risk mitigations that are applied within MakerDAO. Um, they have created a risk team who are MakerDAO community members um, and who are approved by the Maker token holders who will propose risk constructs to be included in the Maker protocol. And the governance mechanism has two functions, proactive governance and reactive governance. And so proactive governance um, includes debates, resolution, automated implementation, and their subtypes of votes or timing are like one-off or initialization votes and intermittent votes and regular votes. And then there's reactive governance, which include like procedural interventions and will change as risk constructs are added to the maker protocol and changed over time. These actions relate to the performance of a function such as an Oracle. And if an Oracle needs to be excluded from the system for some reason, a reactive action needs to be implemented to remove the Oracle. Um, Joe, I don't know if you have any thoughts um, in regards to reactive governance and, and, and how it could impact the Oracle. Still there. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, just so it goes back more about the Oracle pricing. So ensuring that you're not pulling any data from a bad Oracle. So thanks to the way MakerDAO does their Oracle data sourcing. If one Oracle does start to spin off bad information, it can be kicked out uh, through reactive of going through it. So if suddenly one Oracle is flashing through a wrap Bitcoin price of you know 5,000 less than it should be, they can exclude that from their risk models to ensure nothing happens. But it gives them a way to make sure that they're not getting messed with or the problem with oracles and why I keep harping on it is it's such an important security function for how the system works that if bad price data starts getting put into the smart contract, things will go bad and things will get liquidated when they shouldn't get liquidated. So, uh, and also someone could take control of price oracle and start manipulating it. And there's just so many risks when it comes to pricing. So this reactive governance allows them to go back through and remove a bad oracle if something happens. Dot ETH, I think you raised your hand. Do you want to yeah, say I was something? just curious. I was just curious if you guys think that it's kind of a risk that the majority of uh, MakerDAO's contracts are using one Oracle, like just Chainlink alone. Do you think that creates an attack vector or do you think that Chainlink is so big right now that it's probably not a concern? Well, they're using more than just Chainlink. They have multiple Oracles feeding into one feed that then gets fed into the contract. So yeah, Chainlink is definitely the predominant one going in there, but there are other Oracles also coming in to give backup or give also data to make sure it's all being aggregated into one price. Do you know what else they use out of curiosity? I know I that's not part it. of this. Yeah, I couldn't okay. tell you something I'm sorry. <laughs> Neither could I. <laughs> Any other questions though? No, that was it, sorry. If, 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 you put it in the com if you put it in the governance thread, I'm sure we could find out. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Nope. Okay, next slide, please. I think which is also our last slide. Um, so these are the risk parameters controlled by maker governance. So each maker vault um, type has its own unique set of risk parameters that enforce usage. The parameters are determined based on the risk profile of the collateral and are directly controlled by the MKR holders through, through voting. 
um, some of the technical aspects of their risk mitigation is that each um, maker vault has its own unique set of risk parameters that enforce usage and the parameters are determined based on the risk profile of the collateral and are directly controlled by the MKR holders through voting. A proposal contract is the smart contract that can only be executed once and when executed it immediately applies its changes to the internal governance variables of the maker protocol and after execution the proposal contract cannot be reused. And finally, any voter approved modification to the governance variables of the protocol will likely not take into effect immediately in the future. Rather, they could be delayed by as much as 24 hours if voters choose to activate a governance security module, GSM. The delay would give MKR holders the opportunity to protect the system. And if necessary, against malicious governance proposals. So example, if the proposal alters collateral parameters, contrary to the established monetary policies or the agreed upon um, by triggering a shutdown. Thanks, Levi, for coming. <laughs> um, and actually, that's, that's, we're at the end of that. Um, so does anybody have any thoughts or questions or just comments in regards to MakerDAO's approach to, to governance or their risk mitigations? Okay, well, I guess it's just me who got really excited. I don't know, I just find it really interesting. Um, their process, it is really fascinating. I, yeah, I mean, their design is good, um, but I'd actually really be curious as to like how it works in implementation and, and the fact that, you know, you're creating a governance house or there's meta governance kind of shows that there could be a disconnect within community engagement and the design. So sometimes like building the best house if people can't live in it. <laughs> might not be the best idea. So I'd actually really be curious where the gaps are within the process. If you wanna be a really active MKR holder and be really active in the governance space, it, it is a part-time job. It's it's many hours reading proposals. They're complicated. There's a lot yeah. of information going on in all of them. Uh, hence why meta governance is a thing that we're, we're pushing forward and trying to help with because what we can do that other communities can't. So if you're a community or a DAO is holding a ton of MKR tokens, and you don't have to know on your team at the time or the desire to sit there and read through, you know, a couple hours a week of proposals and understanding the different parameters that go into them and the choices that your vote makes. We can go in there and give you guys a quick TLDR or an executive summary for a one pager of all the votes and then really break it down to how it affects your community specifically and what our recommendations would be as well as give you an opinion after the fact of why you voted the way that we did to help protect or to benefit the protocol or voting on behalf of. So it's just representative democracy, essentially. Yeah, yeah, but and I think you have to be very engaged. Exactly what you just mentioned, like it seemed to be a full time job. On the on the other hand, it's necessary to like to make sure that everything goes as as it's governed, but really a full time job. We, we decentralized the bank, right? We, we took an entire bank, how all these people in all these giant buildings all over the world are doing risk modeling, parameters, asset types, collateral types, approving loans, pushing them out, charging fees, uh, origination fees, liquidation fees, actually issuing the die to the right wallet address. All of this is done automated. It, it's absolutely beautiful and insane how the system works. That's why it's so complicated. She so took all those millions of jobs and turned it into smart contracts, but now we're letting not just one person, the CEO, but the entire crowd of everybody who has an interest in this program decide how to govern it. So there needs to be so many uh, different stop gaps and different steps in the way to make sure that people aren't doing anything malicious, stealing anything, and to make sure the protocol keeps functioning properly. Like MakerDAO is absolutely beautiful. It's insane how it's constructed, it's elegant, but it's also complicated. <laughs> I mean, that's very cool how you both guys have explain, explained this, but I think it's like, if you imagine like a, a running state or something, where you can transfer these things to a state. Just imagine that if you go and vote, you don't vote only like for president or something, you really have to actually vote for, I don't know, like a dam uh, who, yeah, which needs to be constructed and you need to read construction plans and stuff like this. So you need to be an expert to really educately vote on the other, or it's just like lottery. 
that's that's like the, the the drawback of this very cool design right yeah absolutely that's also the the benefit of what we're trying to build a governance house is the idea of that you can bring in experts like I'm, i am not a deep deep into governance i'm learning a lot from themes and bukar about governance but i've been in DeFi since the start and i've been using maker for years and i can bring my DeFi information to the conversations that every vote that happens, we have somebody in the group who has deep knowledge of it and we can all discuss it as a group to ensure we're making the right decisions. Because yeah, it's hard to keep up with all this and have the background knowledge to make these choices. Very cool. And we'll see how it goes. I'm very excited about the opportunity and anyone who wants to you know, hear more, uh, follow us there on maker forum uh i think like beginning of next week or the week after we will start posting kind of our opinions and views on uh different proposals and how we can help the the community uh and uh you know if you feel like you have something to add to it like please either comment on it on a forum or like reach out directly uh i would like to hear and other opinions uh, because we are all learning here and that's why we have education sessions as well. And uh, I want to make it right. Thanks for joining folks. Um, catch us next week. Um, we're not really quite sure which one we'll be presenting, but we'll be presenting something. <laughs> Um, and I will converse with Pankar on what that is. But yeah, thanks for joining. Pankar, I think you could stop the recording. And sorry yeah, for the background sounds. <laughs> no worries. Uh, we all need hairdresser at some point. Uh, <laughs> I hope I stop recording or not. So I haven't. <laughs> so it's still on that recording. Uh, <laughs>